Well, what is Paul going to take a stand for? What is he saying? I'm not ashamed of. Well, the verse tells us. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Okay, pop quiz for you this morning. What is the gospel of Christ? We talked about it in Sunday school this morning, at least in pastor's class. What is the gospel of Christ? See, it means murder. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4 tell us that in a nutshell, what the gospel of Christ is, the fact that Jesus Christ came to this earth, he lived a perfect life, that he was crucified, that he died, he was buried, he put dead people on the ground, not people who just fainted or passed out. You put dead people on the ground. Then after three days, what happened? He was raised again from the dead to show us that he is the Son of God, that he has even power over death. He is the Son of God, and that right now he is the right hand of God in heaven. The gospel of Christ is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul says, for I am unashamed, I am not ashamed, I am going to take a stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Well, the verse tells us. For it is the power of God unto salvation. The reason why Paul says that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ is because it is the power of God for people to be saved. It is the only way that man is saved. It is through Jesus Christ that man is saved. No other way can a person have eternal life with God in heaven except through Jesus Christ. The reason why Paul says that I am going to take a stand for the good news of Jesus Christ is because it is the only way for man to be saved. Well, to who is the gospel presentation given? Well, the verse again tells us. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. The gospel presentation is given to everyone. Not everyone will be saved, but the gospel presentation is extended to absolutely everyone. Paul then says to the Jew first, and also the Greek. And that's how Paul did ministry. Wherever he went, he would first approach the Jewish people. You read throughout the book, book of Acts, you find that whatever town he'd go to, he'd go to the synagogue first. If there was no synagogue, he'd find the religious Jewish people and reason with them from the Old Testament Scripture and say, this is the Messiah, who's the prophesied. And his name is Jesus Christ, whom you've crucified. And all of a sudden, when Paul would make that link of, of who Jesus Christ really is, that he is the Messiah, the Jewish people would run him out of the synagogue, they'd run him out of town, they'd want to kill him, they'd want to stone him. But the Gentiles, the Greeks were standing around, they were listening in. They would hear the gospel presentation. They'd get saved. Churches were started. That's how Paul did ministry. Verse 17 continues on. For therein, in the gospel of Christ, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Faith is not just a hope. Faith is a lot more than that. Faith is a knowledge of knowing that something is going to happen. That we will one day spend eternity with God in heaven. It's not just something we hope for. No, we know that that is going to happen. As believers, we know that one day we too will be raised from the dead. Because if Christ can raise himself from the dead, wouldn't he be able to raise us from the dead as well and spend eternity with, with him in heaven? Absolutely! We know that! It's not just something we, we long for or hope for. No, we know that one day we will spend eternity with God in heaven. We live by faith. In these two verses, the Apostle Paul gives us an absolute truth of who God is, who He's done for us. But what happens when man looks at that absolute truth and they start to look at it they start to twist it and turn it, and, and really they start to attack that truth, and they say, no, you know, Jesus really wasn't the Son of God. God really doesn't exist. God really has nothing to do with my life. What happens when man starts to look at absolute truth? And they throw it out. Well, let's read the answer. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. God's wrath, God's anger, is poured out on mankind. Because mankind holds God's truth, the written word, 
in our unrighteous state, we hold His truth. We read His truth. <coughs> and we, re we reject it. We don't care about what God says. In our sinful state, in our unrighteousness, we handle God's Word and we don't care. We throw it out. And so God's wrath is poured out on mankind. Not only that, God has also not only given us the written word, He's also given us a conscience. Verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. God has revealed Himself inside of us. Is that God has written upon our conscience right and wrong. God has written upon our conscience to always seek after Him. Our conscience will always direct us to God. Will always point us to God. But in our sinful state, what have we done to that conscience? We've seared it. We've seared our conscience so vast that no longer do we seek after God. We only seek after sin. And all we care about is how we can protect ourselves and please ourselves. And all we care about in our sinful state is sin. The Bible tells us that, that we see our conscience so bad that no one, no, no one, seek after God. Not only has God given us the written word, not only has He given us conscience, He's also given us creation. Verse 20. For the invisible things have been of Christ, from the creation of the world, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God has given us creation all around us to show us that God exists. God has created this universe with design to show us that God is out there, that He wants a relationship with us. Did you know that the earth is in the perfect distance away from the sun? That if the earth was any farther away from the sun, it would be too cold on earth and we could not sustain life. That if the earth was any closer to the sun, it would be too hot on earth. And again, we could not sustain life. It's at the perfect distance. That we have the moon that rotates around the earth at the right speed, the trajectory, the right angle. That if the moon was any closer to the earth, the gravitational pull of the earth would pull the moon right into the side of it. But it's at the perfect distance. And because of the right distance of the moon, the trajectory, and the rotation around the earth, that it causes ebb and flow of the oceans. That it helps the earth with the four seasons here on earth. We look at creation all around us here on earth. My life is from Iowa. When Iowans put corn in the ground, guess what comes out? Corn. Not soybean. Repro it, uh, cor uh, corn reproduces after its own kind. You look at the animal kingdom. It reproduces after its own kind. Take our human bodies, for example. They're amazing. They show design. The fact that we have uh, DNA that has coded our bodies, that can, came from both sets of our parents, so that we look like our parents. I got this from my dad. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what I think. My wife you know, thinks it's a little different, but. <laughs> we take our eyeballs, for example. My eyeball is amazing. It sees everything upside down. You're up there. But my mind is smart enough to take the image that my eye sees and flips it around. So now you're down here. That I have electrical synapses that run through my entire body that make my feet go, that makes my hand wave this morning. And it just works. That my mind is smart enough to be able to know what language I need to be speaking. To put my all the words that I need to say in the right grammatical context, all in the right word order, and everything just runs smoothly. I don't have to consciously think about what I'm actually going to say. It just flows. There is design everywhere. Throughout creation, there is design that God did this. God has given us the written word. God has given us a conscience. God has given us creation all around us. So at the end of verse 20, the Apostle Paul writes, so that they are without excuse. Man has no excuse for denying the absolute truth of who God is and who God is. 
But what happens when man looks at that truth? They start to still twist it and turn it and finally end up rejecting it. What happens? Well, continue reading, verse 21. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Because then when they knew God, God has revealed Himself to everyone all throughout creation. God has revealed Himself through the written word and inside of us in our conscience is that we know God. We see God. We know that God has to be out there. But man looks at that and says, no, God has nothing to do with that. They look at everything that's around and say, no, not possible. And their vain imagination starts to run wild. And they stand there, you know, in their fancy suits and their PhD degrees from such and such university, and they say, no, 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 God had nothing to do with it. And I can prove, man, a shot of a doubt, that I came from a monkey. Mm -hmm. They profess themselves to be wise, but have become fools. Their imaginations have run wild. They've come up with this system of, of how we have come into existence without God. They know God. They did not glorify things God. Neither were thankful. They became vain in their imaginations. 